I want to say thank you to the Kern Foundation, uh, their amazing dedication, uh, their educational mission regarding a free and virtuous economy. Um, you know, that video clip that we saw talked about um, the freedom to do what we ought, <clears throat> right? Liberty, the freedom to do what we ought, as opposed to license, which is the freedom to do anything, right? That there, that there is a moral vision that goes along with freedom. Now, I'm very glad to be here with you today to talk about uh, the spirit of work, faith, work, the economy. Um, I have to say that I question whether I'm a better choice than your own provost, Dr. Bruce Ashford, who may do more work by the time I arrive in the office in the morning than I do all day. Bruce is a former missionary uh, like Eric Liddell from Chariots of Fire. And I'm sure you guys have all heard that line uh, from the film. Liddell told his sister that when he ran, he could feel the Lord's pleasure. And if we were to ask Bruce, he would likely tell us that when he clears out 100 emails, finishes two book proposals, and submits an essay all before 9 a.m., that he too feels the Lord's pleasure. <laughs> I, on the other hand, feel intimidated. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, there's an old Tennessee story I want to begin with uh, that I heard several years ago. It turns out there was a, a husband and a father out in the country uh, who was not providing for his family because of his incredible aversion to work. If you talk to folks from the South who have a deep enough history, they have a word for such a person. They say, he's sorry. And they don't mean he's apologetic. They mean he's a sorry excuse for a man. Well, the events of this story take place long ago, uh, way before there are any federal or state welfare programs, uh, no food stamps, and so this family is just barely scraping by. And if the husband did get hold of any money, he was like the man in Roger Miller's song, Dang Me. Have any of you ever heard that song, Dang Me? Uh, not many. Great American songbook, Dang Me, look it up. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a lyric from that song. Sitting around drinking with a bunch of the guys, six rounds bought and I bought five. Spent the groceries and half the rent, something like $14.27. Dang me. Okay. So you get the idea of the type of guy this is. In those days, if you had a man who wasn't taking care of his wife and kids, then people in the community would have to make up the difference by secretly giving food or money to the wife so that she could feed herself and the children. And under those circumstances, it wasn't unusual for a group of, let's say, civic-minded men to get together and make sure that the poor provider fulfilled his responsibilities. One night, the moon was full and such a group of men decided to pay this fellow a visit. If you don't get what I'm saying, they intended to threaten him with a show of force. They probably hoped just to shame him into doing what he ought, but if that wasn't enough, they were maybe willing to rough him up and leave him with some bruises as a stimulus to find work. But the local Southern Baptist pastor had gotten wind of the plan. This was a peaceful man, I'm sure just like the pastors that are trained at this, this great institution. And so he decided to intervene. So this young pastor arrived in the nick of time just as the men were confronting this lazy patriarch. The pastor rode up with his horse and wagon full of corn and he said, hold on everybody. I have brought a wagon full of corn the family will be fed, and we can talk about this another time when cooler heads might prevail. Now, under normal circumstances, that might have been the end of it. But this shiftless daddy, that's another good Southern word, shiftless, was pretty hardcore and probably more afraid of working than of taking a beating. Hold on a minute, he said. You are presumptuous, Pastor. I am not sure the matter is resolved. Before I agree to accept your gift, I have a question. Is that corn shut or unshut? <laughs> oh, the depravity, right? <clears throat> There's also the story about a man who told his buddy he was tired of mowing the lawn. Well, his friend said, you could try getting a goat. I'll do it, he replied. A few weeks later, they saw each other and the friend asked the man how it was going with the goat and the grass. Not very well, he said. 
No matter what I do, I can't get the goat to push the mower. <clears throat> now, I told you these, these kind of humorous stories, thank you for laughing, to, uh, to point out a, a misconception some people have about work. These fellows I'm talking about are probably not great students of the Bible. And they probably got the idea that work was part of the curse that fell on human beings as a consequence for the first sins. Though I'm talking to a group of people who probably are actually very strong students of the Scripture, I still have to say for the record that this idea about work is way off base. We know that God performed the work of creation and then rested from that work. He wasn't punishing Himself. And we know that Adam had work in the garden uh, in Genesis 2.15 before the fall of man, not only after. Work is not something to be avoided. It is a meaningful and life-giving activity. We work constantly in an activity of, of what Tolkien called sub-creation, beneath God's original creation. And yet we do seem to buy in the idea that work is something to avoid if we can. Many Americans live for the weekends or for retirement when they'll be able to pursue leisure activities such as recreational travel or simply rest and conform various, consume various forms of media. Uh, binge watching, for example, is a thing, right? I'm, I'm guilty, binge watching. Uh, we dream of, of what it would be like to be free from the necessity of work. Now I've been a lifelong science fiction enthusiast and throughout my decades of reading the stories in novels and comics, the vision of winning the battle over work has been on the horizon. I can recall an old Superman comic in which he travels to the future to see men and women drinking cocktails served by robots while automatic tractors till the fields. Others have prophesied universal basic incomes provided by technocratic governments that will free human beings from drudgery. I told you my, my silly stories about slackers who didn't want to work, but there's actually a, a much more serious side of the problem. And I, and I ask you to give me some patience as we spin this out. I don't want you to take this as a diatribe because there's actually a different, different direction this will go. Uh, reports are beginning to pile up in the news about the, the missing men in the American workforce. Historically, it has been the, the overwhelming norm for American men to be employed uh, throughout their working life. Uh, but National Public Radio recently reported that the 4.9% unemployment rate masks a disturbing phenomenon among American men of prime working age. As many as 10 million of them have simply vanished from the workforce. They've dropped out. They're not working nor are they attempting to find work. And as a result, uh, they are not counted in the official employment statistics. They have managed to live with parents or with a, a spouse or a girlfriend. Uh, and spend their time possibly satisfied with playing video games or streaming television and movies. NPR also notes that most of these men are not using their time away from jobs to be primary caregivers for their families. And of course, that is work as well. Only 5% of these missing workers are serving as primary caregivers. At the same time, and directly related to this phenomenon, is the fact that disability payment recipients continue to grow in number. Again, from the National Public Radio report, we have, uh, we have a story that the federal government is now spending more on disability payments than it does on food stamps and welfare combined. Look at the billboards out on the highways. There appears to be a big business for attorneys who promise clients that they can help them to begin to receive disability payments. Now, none of this is, is to say that there are not uh, worthy recipients of those kind of benefits, uh, people who are injured, for instance. Uh, but it seems to be the case that the disability category is the frontier of this idea of the universal basic income that I talked about. If you can't get a middle class income out of a high school degree, which was once absolutely feasible, uh, there's a reasonable chance that you'll end up on disability. Now I want to read to you from the conclusion of the NPR investigation of the disability program. Now again, remember, this is National Public Radio. This is not Fox News or National Review. Uh, disability has become a de facto welfare program for people without a lot of education or job skills. 
but it wasn't supposed to serve this purpose. It's not a retraining program designed to get people back on their feet. Once people go on to disability, and I underline this, they almost never go back to work. Fewer than 1% of those who were on the Federal Program for Disabled Workers at the beginning of 2011 have returned to the workforce since then. In most cases, going on disability means you will not work, you will not get a raise, you will not get the meaning that people get from their work. Going on disability means assuming that you rely only on those payments, you will be poor for the rest of your life. That's the deal, and it's the deal 14 million Americans have signed up for. Now, as you sit here listening to me begin the discussion this way, you might have the idea that I'm going to make out some kind of case against these individuals who are uh, absorbing government benefits and adding to the tax burden or the debt burden, uh, but that's actually not the way I want to go uh, with this today, not at all. Um, I think the people who are, who are not working and who are surviving through family members, boyfriends, girlfriends, or receive governmental benefits are not properly seen as advantage takers, uh, cheating the rest of us out of our money. No. These are people who are losing out. They occupy a bad position in society and a bad position, in many cases, spiritually. There may be a temptation to think of them as taking advantage of those who wake up every morning and, and head off to work, who have somewhere to go. But the truth is they tend to live a marginal existence. We might call this person sort of basic income consumer man. And basic income consumer man falls well short of the Genesis vision of man as the working steward of the earth. <clears throat> the reality is that life without work is not a good life. I mentioned portrayals of life with, with income and without work in science fiction. <clears throat> While some workers, would, some writers would present that state of affairs as a great social advance to be hoped for, others see it as something profoundly negative. Uh, I think of Nancy Cress's Beggars in Spain series, in which she envisions a future inhabited by two groups of people, the livers, and I don't mean that organ in your body, uh, livers, people who live and the mules, and, and I don't mean the four-legged creature. The mules are the human beings who do the work of the society. <clears throat> the idea is, is that the livers, the people who simply live, are the winners. And they don't have to do anything and are taken care of by the hardworking mules, those few people who still have jobs. But the secret is, is that the mules, though presented as the ones who carry the burden of society are actually the ones who thrive. Working strengthens them and provides them with purpose. They are smart, industrious, and they have something to contribute to community life. They are indispensable, and they do not want to be livers, although the livers are supposedly the winners. The story turns some of our presuppositions on their heads. We think of the privileged as the ones who don't have to work and instead can simply indulge in leisure. But Cress understands that work is actually the key to a fulfilling existence. You might also think of the, the Pixar film, WALL-E. Uh, now, I understand that, that Dr. Greg Forster was here uh, last week. Dr. Forster is a gigantic Pixar nerd, so I hope he didn't use my illustration. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, human beings in WALL-E have had to abandon their planet. And in the process, they have adopted a lifestyle of, of simply existing on board an enormous spaceship. And as we see the story unfold, there are some opportunities to observe their decline. We meet them at a point where they float around on reclining hover chairs, drink smoothies, and watch the screens projected in front of their faces. These people are redeemed by ultimately returning to the earth and taking up the work of restoring their lost civilization. There is a real sense in which they appear to reclaim the mantle of Adam. And notably, they have to take back power from the technology that has usurped their rightful place. 
They will tend to the creation and exercise a vigorous stewardship over it. In the ending credits, we see them becoming stronger, leaner, and more purposeful. These are tasks, the tasks of stewardship for which bodies were made. <clears throat> this message is not lost on me, don't worry. Uh, the, the good life is not an escaping work. The good life consists in finding meaningful work to do. And work is one of the primary avenues through which we make a contribution to the lives of others while simultaneously enriching our own lives. Work connects us. Work helps to bridge the gap between people who sometimes would rather not deal with each other. And you know, technology doesn't help. I, I uh, recently was in a gas station and I watched the cashier and the woman who was standing there with her purchases uh, the entire time they both were, were totally glued to their own phones and uh, they did not acknowledge each other at all. And it seemed to me like a transaction between an ATM and a vending machine. Uh, no, no humans actually necessary. <clears throat> now, uh, Professor Brad Berzer's recent biography of Russell Kirk's life includes kind of these mini biographies of other figures. And one of them is, is Wilhelm Röpke. Uh, Christian economist uh, who helped bring about a miraculous turnaround in West Germany uh, after the Second World War. One notable story includes an encounter between Röpke and his Jewish friend, the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, who was forced to flee his homeland uh, because of Nazi persecution. So in Geneva, at the beginning of World War II, the German-born Christian, Röpke, showed his friend and guest, von Mises, the public space that had been divided into garden plots, which would allow the citizens of Geneva a place to grow produce uh, should the war deprive the city of food. Mises looked at these garden plots and shook his head and said, a very inefficient way of producing foodstuffs. Ah, Rokey responded, but perhaps a very efficient way of producing human happiness. What did Röpke mean? Both men were accomplished economists who understood the gains achieved by specialization, automation, and economies of scale. But Röpke perceived that there are other considerations that should count. And it might be reasonable to think that the people of Geneva, in this example, would be better off especially if we consider the spirit as well as the material, by having the responsibility to tend garden plots instead of passively relying upon some effort efficiently organized without them. Having the food is good and important. It is essential. But having the food and the work that produces the food might be even better, especially in fearful times. Work with the goal of protecting against bad circumstances might actually strengthen the spirit. It might actually produce joy. <clears throat> Röpke's marvelous book, A Humane Economy, you might look at that for history of ideas, uh, <clears throat> is a tour de force of scholarship in a tradition that some refer to as, as Christian humanism. And throughout the book, he passionately and wisely argues for a vision of man as something other than uh, homo economicus, he saw a danger inherent in both capitalism and socialism. Both could be reductively materialistic. Both systems could simply focus on meeting material needs and wants without being concerned with the spiritual nature of human beings. <clears throat> Röpke feared that our obsession with tending to material satisfaction would lead us to the boredom of the child who has his wishes immediately fulfilled. New toys relieve boredom for only a short time. And he worried that the obsession in his time with, with new vacuum cleaners and, and electric razors uh, would contribute to an identity for human beings primarily as consumers. He asked, is there any more certain way of desiccating the soul of man than the habit of constantly thinking about money and what it can buy? Is there a more potent poison than our economic system's all-pervasive commercialism? What Röpke realized is that material progress, and I promise you I like it as much as anyone, can have effects that we don't even think about. It's interesting to consider that the Amish 
Don't shun technology on purely uh, theological grounds. Rather, they believe that embracing certain technologies will undermine important values they share within the community. Those values have to do with things such as the nature of work, the ways families spend time together, priorities centered around service to others in the community and the ability to focus attention for long periods. Uh, anyone with a family with uh, children of a certain age and smartphones understands what I'm talking about. The key point here is that we should not be too satisfied with a society that is simultaneously extremely good at delivering material well-being to people, but contributes to the development of human beings who may not live good lives. Yes, material goods are much of what we want out of the economy, but it is also the case that the work itself constitutes an important part of the reward. We need to be reminded of that. <clears throat> now, George Orwell uh, imagined a totalitarian state in his 1984 that controlled people through the, the constant threat of war, uh, steady propaganda, and purposeful scarcity with regard to food, clothing, and shelter. But I think it's generally agreed that Aldous Huxley painted the truer picture uh, in his Brave New World. I urge you to read it if you haven't. Uh, it pictures consumeristic, highly medicated people. Uh, you know, the quote is, it's better to take a gram than to give a damn. Uh, plastic people, they, they suck on sex hormone chewing gum and they say things like, she's so pneumatic. And uh, what that means is filled with air. So she has the appearance of being filled with air. That's desirable. Uh, and their materially prosperous ways of life are virtually designed to drown out any thought of God. <clears throat> All of their material needs are met and their free time is flooded with pleasure, but they lead lives that are vacant of any meaning other than the ones they're conditioned to discern. That brings to mind a third book dealing with dystopia that we might consider, which is the abolition of man, but that, that unfortunately has to wait for another time. Uh, Peter Drucker, probably the single most important uh, management theorist of the 20th century, and by the way, a mentor to Rick Warren, of all people, uh, shared Ropke's concern with the insufficiency of something like a master plan of income provision. He wrote that too many modern writers fail to realize that unemployment is a serious problem for reasons beyond the lack of money. Unemployment, in his view, leads to social disenfranchisement. The unemployed often don't share a life with employed people. Uh, they don't tend to interact with the employed socially. <clears throat> in fact, I should just say, this is, something, this is something where the church can maybe step in. Uh, the church needs to find a way to bring the two types of people together. So too often the church is like the, the cruise ship uh, that I went on, you know, carnival cruise ship on my honeymoon uh, where we sat down at our dinner table and everybody at the table was just like us. It was clear that we had been selected uh, to be together. Uh, Drucker also thought that the unemployed were uniquely vulnerable to games of chance. They believe that their lack of work is a result of forces beyond their control. So why not try to benefit from such random movements of fortune? Uh, as an aside, I can recall sitting in a Hardee's one morning near a woman who coughed while she worked her way through a thick pile of scratch off lottery tickets. And I thought about the commercials the state of Tennessee pays for in an attempt to entice people like her to spend what money they have on an activity that was once policed by vice squads. It was called the numbers racket. Now it is a voluntary tax that actually transfers money from the poor to people who are, who are doing better. <clears throat> Drucker, correctly ascertained, even after the Second World War, that we have the technical ability. We have the technical ability to provide the essentials to all Americans. But what people really want out of employment is what Drucker called social status and function. He said that entitlement programs are like vitamins. They remedy deficiencies, but they don't, produce, they don't provide calories. Now, what did Drucker mean by that? What does that mean, social status and function? He was referring to the things that come with work beyond just the money. 
People tend to respect work as at least partially constitutive of a life. So part of it is the way others perceive you. That's the status. But what about the function? The function is the actual contribution that you make through working. Yes, you earn money, you take care of yourself and your loved ones, but there is something else. By working, you help create something of value that enters the economy of exchange. You have actually put something out into the world that might not have been there, but for your time and effort and others like you. You have blessed others and stand to be blessed in turn. Working relates to the golden rule. Working relates to love of neighbor. To the extent that people are being left out of the world of work through technological innovation, educational limitations, changes in the nature of occupations, disruption in various industries, and, and even though programs such as the Disability Fund I mentioned earlier, both our society and the lives of the individuals involved lose something important. What do we need to understand about this economy in which we exchange the products of our work and which is so important to human flourishing? Well, I think it's critically important that we reject the idea that the market is just its own secular thing <clears throat> and that we will just mess it up by bringing our extraneous moral uh, and spiritual frameworks to bear upon it. That's a mistake. Let me return to Ropke who noted that the modern market system is not self-sustaining. <clears throat> it draws upon reserves that the market did not create. So to quote Ropke, self-discipline, a sense of justice, honesty, fairness, chivalry, moderation, public spirit, respect for human dignity, firm ethical norms. All of these are things which people must possess before they go to the market and compete with each other. These are the indispensable supports which preserve both market and competition from degeneration. Family, church, genuine communities, tradition, these are the sources. The market, competition, the play of supply and demand do not create these ethical reserves. They presuppose them and they consume them. And you know, if you need evidence of this, I don't know if some of you have followed the recent controversy over the pricing of EpiPens, uh, but, there's, but there's a real question of, of whether, uh, whether the way capitalism is supposed to work is almost predatory in nature or, or like some kind of strategy game. Uh, if we lose the moral vision behind the market, that's what it degenerates into. <clears throat> there are conditions spiritual conditions that need to exist in order for the market to function. When they are lacking, the government will have to step in more and more frequently to try to rein in predatory and dishonest behavior. In a society that lacks virtue, Plato observed in his Republic, we shall have great need of both doctors and judges to address sick bodies and sick souls. To be blunt, sin corrupts our work and our motives. <clears throat> we need Christ to help us to work rightly and for good reasons. We need our God who helps us to believe in truth and love and to express those things through our work. The less that we have Christ, the more laws and regulations we will have to have. Part of what the church can do is to help human beings have the spiritual resources to contribute to a good economy. What is a good economy? It's an economy where there's an honest exchange of value between the participants. The work that is done has quality. Services performed possess a degree of excellence. Those who pay exchange the fruit of their labor for that offered by their neighbors in the community. We should help people to understand that through our work, our, we give glory to God and we show love to our neighbor. A cold, sterile, and secular view of the economy ends up being something like a game between utility and profit maximizers. You look out for yourself, I look out for myself. I want to pay the absolute least I can. You want to work as little as possible to produce the good I'm buying. Somehow that situation is supposed to result in us doing good for one another and without the need for any overarching moral values that exist outside the system, but that's not right. People and organizations occupy many different positions of strength 
and sophistication in the broader economy. Without spiritual values, the kind that we receive from the Christian faith, then the game can be played ruthlessly and in such a way that trust is misplaced. Instead, we may see a lot of predation and we may see rational loafing and technically permissible cheating. Employers, workers, and customers alike seeking to be users of one another. The Bible enjoins the use of, use of honest weights and measures as expressed in at least 11 places in the Old Testament with five of those in Proverbs over against the shady, advantage-taking, selfish spirit that can overtake us. We instead have to seek to give value for value. I must become the kind of person who chooses to learn my craft or my profession so that I can give something good to others. And they should do the same so that they can render good to me. We aren't seeking to take advantage of one another, but rather to honestly, lovingly, and for mutual benefit, create and add value to be exchanged between neighbors, brothers, and sisters. <clears throat> now, you know, I know that many folks think of professors as people who live in ivory towers, disconnected from the real world. Uh, I find myself thinking seriously, though, all the time about the, the practical nature of the work of being a professor. Maybe it has to do with the notion that all the students in the world could just sign up for gigantic online classes taught by celebrity professors. <clears throat> but my profession is in a time of self-examination. And I have thought about a scene from the film Goodwill Hunting, uh, in which Matt Damon's character jumps into an unbalanced intellectual matchup between his friend and a student at an Ivy League school. And as part of the confrontation, Damon's character mocks the privileged university student by saying that he could have had the same education for a couple of dollars if he'd only thought to obtain a library card and make good use of it. <clears throat> I continue to think about that scene. Is it really a fair representation of the situation? It serves nicely to take the starch out of the egotistical Ivy Leaguer, but for me it raises a simple question. How do I add value to the education of my students? Are they just as well off if I were to just hand them the syllabus and uh, tell them to come back in a few months for a final test? Of course, even that would require my knowledge to determine the readings. There are other things I bring to the table. I'm an interpreter of these texts that I've selected. I know the most critical parts of each book or article. I know the debates that lie behind them. I'm capable of judging student efforts at articulating their own understanding and what they've learned. At my best, maybe I can even write the books or articles that the students will study in their courses. This is the nature of my work. If I do those things well, then I add value to the process and the students receive benefit from me being there. This is the fundamental nature of the challenge that we all face. All of us should think about our work and what we bring to it. We should be serious about that in our spirit. I just used the, the corporate sounding language of adding value. That, that may be my problem in that I, I worked in the corporate world for a while before I became a professor. <clears throat> So let me employ something much more straightforward and plain. Lester DeCoster, uh, former director of the library at Calvin College for many years, uh, wrote a wonderful little volume about work. And he wrote, this is, a, this is a wonderful little statement, work is the form in which we make ourselves useful to others. DeCoster continued by saying that work puts us in the service of others and that through work that serves others, we also serve God. God weaves all this work into a culture, and DeCoster pointedly notes that if all this work stops, so does civilization. But what I love <coughs> about DeCoster's formulation, that work is the form in which we make ourselves useful to others, is that it is so personal. It's about relationship and exchange between people. Um, <clears throat> I have a, it's kind of a strange story I want to tell you. Uh, there was a day probably a dozen years ago when I went to the grocery store with my two children. Uh, they were probably four and one at the time. And those of you who are parents can imagine 
uh, that an errand of that sort can actually be quite a task. Um, I made my way through the store and tried to get all the things on our list. And at the same time, I had to keep these small children happy enough to, to kind of stick with me and, you know, not lose their minds. Uh, what I remember, maybe because I once had the job of, of bagging groceries and I was not particularly good at it, uh, is the extraordinary competence with which the young man helping me did his job. He grouped the items perfectly. When I unloaded the bags at my home, I noticed that each bag had a similar weight. It was unusually easy to get the bags into the house. I could, I could get the maximum number at each arm. I imagine this may sound like a silly thing, but it should mean something to you that I have remembered it all these years. That young man really served me that day, and I'm, I'm grateful to him still. And there are other examples. You know, maybe there's something like that has resonated with you. Was it a, a perfectly level set of shelves in a bookcase? A well-designed device that anticipates the best ways you might use it? Beautifully grown fruits and vegetables that are pleasing to the eye and the palate? Properly sealed doors and windows that reduce your energy bill? A clean office? a mechanically sound and reliable automobile, well-stitched clothing that maintains its fit and shape, a comfortable chair, a news report that accurately informs, laws that are judiciously enforced. That's a big one right now. All of this and more is work that matters. It blesses. It communicates love. This is not just materialism. It is gratitude that someone cared to make their work beneficial to you. Human beings live best when they are able to function on both sides of this equation. To have something to contribute and to receive. This is something that is true to the kind of creatures we are and have been created to be by God. So in light of the things that we've said, uh, what, kind of, what kind of thoughts should we keep in mind going forward? I think that we need to treat employees as persons made in God's image and with the capacity and the need to make a contribution through work. Much of the management literature has to do with serving the customer, but I think there is a developing understanding that employers who focus on the good of their employees actually see better products and services delivered to the customers. The employee is not simply a device to be used to perform a job that a machine can't do yet. Employers should see workers as ends rather than means and as partners in the process of making a positive contribution together for the customer. We should encourage employees to use the same kind of vision with regard to employers. The employer is not just a paycheck machine. Proper understanding of means and ends apply to this side of the relationship as well. The employer may be the person who had the vision for the, benef for the business or maybe, or maybe is just a manager. But in all cases, the employer has a high responsibility of stewardship, which the employee should join. Because if they don't, they may be in the position of the servant who hid the talent he was given rather than putting it to use. <clears throat> the simple reality is that the employer and the employee are both in the situation of exercising stewardship over the things with which they have been entrusted. And they should see each other as partners in doing work that ultimately should be part of the work of God's kingdom. In law school, uh, I can remember studying principals and agents. Principals were owners and agents were those who were tasked with carrying out the will of the principal. But the reality is, is that we are all agents with God as the principal. That understanding is clear as we read the Bible. We also need to give people the courage not to drop out of the world of work. It may be true in the strictly material sense that we can provide more and more goods with fewer people working, but it will be bad for the lives of human beings if we become a society of people who matter in terms of productivity and others who simply consume and stand on the sidelines. The trend seems to be running against human flourishing in that regard, but I hope the church can be part of the answer. Finally, we need to keep in mind that the economy should be a system of benefit. This goes back to the, the discussion I was having about the moral underpinnings of the economy. We cannot allow the modern world to buy into this kind of soulless idea of the economy as something that's just totally based on utility, right? 
we need to understand that there are richer, you know, richer reasons to have a market than simply to, uh, to provide wealth. <clears throat> now, I began this talk with, a, with kind of a funny old Tennessee tale uh, of a man who was determined to avoid work, even at a cost to his family and community. I'd like to move to a conclusion with a true Tennessee story. My grandmother turned 100 this past spring. <clears throat> when her husband, my grandfather died, I had a lot of regret uh, over the way that I had not been interested in hearing him tell stories about the, about the old days. You know, back then around the time he died, I was, I was much younger and I just wanted to leave the house and, and visit with my friends. Um, and it was important to me to avoid the same mistake with my grandmother. <clears throat> so when I go see her these days, it's a good time to talk about her childhood. Her short-term memory is, is not reliable, which can make conversations based on a year like 2016 difficult. But she can accurately remember almost everything about the past. And she remembers her own mother, a woman they called, I have no idea why, Nando. She was Nando. Uh, her real name was Ollie, but for some reason they called her Nando. <coughs> And they say that Nando could outwork any two men. She was the classic Proverbs 31 woman, uh, wise in business, good at organizing tasks, financially shrewd. In addition to being a great wife and mother, she hitched up the wagon and sold butter and eggs in town to make, ca to make cash. Uh, and she was a great cook, legendary cook. Uh, when Nando became old and blind, my grandmother cared for her over a period of many years. She hired a woman to watch her mother during the day uh, while she was out running a school lunchroom. And then she came home to care for her the rest of the day and night. Uh, and this went on for, for many years. You could see that both mother and daughter had a strong work, work ethic that benefited others and which embodied love. They lived on a, a small farm in, in a town called Hohenwald. Uh, uh, which means high forest. It's a little strange because this is middle Tennessee we're talking about, but Hohenwald, the high forest. Uh, the house was simple and, and small uh, for the parents and the three siblings. And, uh, you know, I asked about the, about the cold winters without, without radiators, furnaces, or heat pumps. My grandmother told me that it, that it did often become very cold. And, and, and even worse, her father insisted on smothering the fire every night uh, for safety. And they slept under quilts that they made, you know, lots and lots of quilts, no plumbing, no electricity is very, uh, a simple and challenging existence that required work most of the time, uh, including things like making their own soap. And I asked her if they were happy living that way. And she surprised me a little by saying that she thought they were probably happier than people today. And when I asked her why, she said, we needed each other. Our parents even needed us children. They needed us to work. I think we were happy because we all contributed something for the family. We knew how we belonged to each other. I didn't, I didn't have any trouble believing her. Uh, this is a woman who, who uh, she showed her dedication to work. Uh, when she retired from running school lunch rooms, she immediately went to work uh, as a volunteer at the hospital gift shop. She did that for, for decades. Uh, in fact, she didn't quit her job as a volunteer at the hospital gift shop until she was 94. And the reason was, was because they got a new cash register and she didn't feel like she could learn how to work it. The truth is, is that it just gets harder to learn as we age. Uh, I feel the same way about Snapchat. If I had to tell you what Snapchat is. All right, <clears throat> the takeaway here is that work is a gift from God, not a curse. Work can be tiresome and difficult, but it is not something we should wish away. The science fiction dreams of human beings released from all labor should probably better be seen as nightmares. Being without work is a loss, not a gain. Even if a government check softens the blow, we are made to continually be in fellowship with one another, working, creating value, giving, receiving. This is who God has made us to be. Work is an important way that we can express love of God and love of our neighbor. 
Work can help deliver us from a trivial existence based on continual self-amusement and consumption. When the Lord returns, let us to be found working and not to make ourselves wealthy and powerful, but so as to be found faithful as his chosen stewards and his brothers and sisters trying to shine forth for his kingdom and his glory. Thank you.